I look at neurotypical life and I'm sorry, I don't really want to be one of you. I'm not particularly impressed that it is a better way of life. It's a different way of life. And I celebrate the difference the same way I embrace people that are in any way different. But I don't want to be neurotypical. I'm happy being what I am. And I think a person who's going to come out and try and cure me because I make them uncomfortable, I think they need to deal with themselves. Because I'm not uncomfortable. Neurotypical is a term used by autistic people to describe non-autistic people. The footage you just watched is from a trailer from a documentary with the same name, and it explores the idea of what it means to be normal, and what exactly does it mean to experience the world in an atypical fashion. According to the DSM-5, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder and varies greatly in severity. One of the main criteria are impairments in social communication and social interactions in different situations, for instance social reciprocity, nonverbal communication, or the maintenance of relationships. In the following clip, we see some examples from the show Atypical. I'm a weirdo. That's what everyone says. Sometimes I don't know what people mean when they say things. Sam, people on the spectrum date, you know. Girls don't really notice me at all, and I'm not great at picking up signals. She's smiling right at you. You need to turn that down like 70%. The second diagnostic criteria of the DSM-5 are restricted and repetitive behaviors, interests, and activities. Some examples are repetitive motor movements, but also hyper and hypo sensitivity to sensory information is also sometimes one of the symptoms associated with autism. For the next few days, I silently observed Gabe in his classes and social surroundings. The purpose of this was to capture the ways in which he typically interacts with his world, most often through motor movement. This is typically referred to as stimming, or self-stimulation. Stimming is a behavior that is commonly associated with autism and can be done for a variety of reasons. Stimming can occur when an individual is overstimulated to block out excess sensory input, or vice versa when they are understimulated. And to get a better indication of hypersensitivity to sensory input, the following is an interpretation of what it might be like. Autism used to be considered quite a rare occurrence, but now is thought of as being quite common. According to the CDC, 1 in 59 children is diagnosed with autism in the United States, with boys being four times more likely to be diagnosed. The increase in prevalence might be due to several reasons, such as better awareness and greater recognitions amongst clinicians, as well as the broadening of the definition of autism. That is because autism is considered a spectrum disorder, which means that symptoms vary on the spectrum from people who need some support to people who need very substantial support. The etiology of autism is highly complex, but it seems evident that autism is mostly biomedical. It consists of genetic, epigenetic and neuro aspects. Autism is partly heritable, however the exact genes involved in the development of ASD remain elusive. Currently, around 800 genes throughout the whole human genome have been linked to autism. However, as you can see on this graph, the genes that have been identified are almost on every single chromosome in the human genome, which makes it more difficult to pin down exact genes that are related to the underlying cause of autism. However, genes don't tell the whole picture. As twin studies suggest that even with the same genetic package, it is possible for one of the two to not show any symptoms. This suggests that epigenetics might also play a role in the development of autism. However, there are risk factors related to an increased probability of conceiving a child with autism. For example, older parents above a certain age might have mutations that occur in their reproductive cells and can predispose the development of autism. Neuro evidence suggests that developing children with autism exhibit neural overgrowth in the brain, with up to 65% more neurons compared to the typically developing children. Initially, the amygdala in children with autism is larger early in life, causing excessive anxiety and fear, which can perhaps also contribute to social withdrawal, 
With continuous stress, the release of stress hormone cortisol degrades neurons in the amygdala, causing a lower density of neurons within the amygdala during adulthood. This damaged amygdala may account for different ways autistic people respond to social situations. Another neural impairment in people with autism is the higher order association areas of the brain that normally connect to the frontal lobe are partially disconnected. There are fewer long range connections in autistic brains and more short range connections. Additionally, dendritic spine density is higher, suggesting more local connections between neurons. These neural findings could possibly explain some of the specific neurobehavioral features that are sometimes found in autism. For example, Children with autism are more detail-oriented rather than looking at the bigger picture and are better at recognizing patterns. So although they have trouble socializing, they may be superior in other aspects, suggesting there are different degrees of autism of which some could actually be beneficial in certain fields. For example, autistic people have a tendency to be very interested in systems and are better at mechanical reasoning tasks. Taken together, the detail orientation, pattern recognition, and mechanical reasoning might suggest that people with autism are better systematizers compared to the general population. Systematizing refers to being interested in systems and predicting them according to lawful rules. Some examples of these are computers, mathematics, and engineering. Although being high on systematizing may have its advantages, it could also lead to trouble understanding the social world because it's often less predictable and its rules are complex. However, there might be more than one way to make sense of the world and not one single way for the brain to develop. There are cognitive differences within the population, with each individual having a preference for a certain cognitive style. Some are better at spatial reasoning or math, whereas others are better at social interactions. One theory of autism suggests that the whole population can be mapped onto two axes, one representing empathizing or the ability to understand social relations, and the other representing systematizing or the ability to understand things and systems. For example, in the general population, a higher percentage of females tend to be higher on empathizing, which is represented by the light blue area, whereas males tend to be higher on systematizing, which is represented by the pink area. People diagnosed with autism tend to be extremely high on systematizing compared to empathizing, which is represented in the red area. A case could be made for the concept of neurodiversity, which suggests that there's just not one normal brain or way to experience and rationalize the world around us, but rather that there's a large diversity of different brain types. And to conclude, we would like to end on a personal story about autism. I'm Tamara and I'm autistic. I was a quite intelligent child and I could familiarize myself with uh, patterns and social interaction. Not to say that I did not struggle, but other people then tend to notice these difficulties I had, as I mimicked the patterns quite well. Um, it did give my, me quite some anxiety though, because I knew I wasn't like other peers. I couldn't say I'm fine when I was clearly not. And I didn't understand why other people would even do that. Uh, but after a while, I decided why let it be a hurdle when it can be my strength? Uh, why would I sh uh, follow all these social nor norms and not be true to myself. This way I may have lost some friends and may have not gained as many as I would have otherwise because I was perceived quite direct. I was maybe even harsh. Um, but the friends that I have now are really great and this is mostly because I can say I'm not f I'm feeling awful today but how are you? And this way I can get closer to people building stronger relationships right from the start instead of following first a set of ambiguous social rules. And realizing that I'm not like my peers also led me to do extended research on what could be wrong with me. <laughs> and this way I stumbled upon the concept of autism and my first so-called special interest was born, autism and mental health issues. From a very young age, I read all the books my library had to offer on this topic and I gathered all the information a six-year-old can get from the internet. I could spend days on this little research project. But my experience differs from that from, for example, a typical Sam, whose special interest has been penguins all this time. After a while of focusing on mental health issues, I became interested in languages and LGBTQ spaces and all these interests that still dominate my life in adulthood as I am learning to become a professional researcher in the field of how mental health and language use are intertwined and the ability to hyper focus on these interests is really helpful in this. Um, 
another thing, a lot of people in this community tend to think about is who we are and what our purpose in this world is. Because I felt different, I started to think about what I wanted to do, what can I do for this world and who am I? And this makes me a highly ambitious person because uh, once I set my mind to do something, I will do everything in my power to achieve that goal. And combined with this hyper-focus and my special interest we already talked about, this is fairly doable <laughs> to me. And this is why I thrive in the environment of academia, for example. My autism and my intelligence make perfect combination for doing research. I can focus on detail, I excel at doing repetitive tasks for like data entry, which most people find very, very boring. Uh, and I'm also able to think outside of the box, because even though my social skills are less than average, uh, which is mostly perceived as negative, in this way it can be perceived as positive too. For example, when trying to overcome biases in critical thinking, uh, by saying things like, is this really a problem or is it just not that common? And even though autism may have its disadvantages, such as not being in touch with my emotions as much as you should, or my inflexibility, it also brought me the possibility to be true, true to myself and in my relationship with others. Oh, and it makes me an excellent planner as I do love my routine. So, what do you make out of the findings and the theories that we've presented to you today? Do you think there is something like neurodiversity and that autism might be one example of it? Or do you think that there is a normal or typical way of experiencing the world? In any case, I hope you give it some thought and thank you very much for watching our video.